Okay, so I've got some lines drawn, and most importantly, I've drawn the outline of the space that I want on my on my sheet, on my drawing that I'm going to print out. So now uh, I'm going to set up the page, and most importantly, I'm going to set up the scale before I attempt to draw in the text. And so the, the notes here that we have, all of those uh, text items, and also the dimensions have text in them as well. So by setting up the scale, it'll help me with all of those things. So they're collectively all referred to as annotation. Exactly, yeah. And then also notice that these furniture pieces that I've left out have things like dashed lines. So dashed lines also depend on the scale because their size can change and that is again dependent on the scale of your drawing. So I'm going to first show you how to set the scale in a simple way, very easy. From the panel in the bottom right where you'll see it probably will be on one to one initially. You can then choose a scale like one to fifty. In this case it will be one to fifty, we've only got one scale. So there's a little option down on the bar at the bottom where it should say one to one and you can just choose a scale from that list. Now this doesn't need to be the scale for everything because you will often have more than one scale in a single drawing. So just choose the most common scale that you're going to be working with there. But in this case we only have one scale, one to fifty is all we I will say if you've got a floor plan that might be at 1 to 100 or 1 to 50 and then some details that might be at 1 to 5, um, they could all be produced in the same drawing. Yep. Yep, that's right. Exactly. Yep, that's right. And so then, to make things clear though, I am going to set up a sheet as well. So you can see you have tabs down the bottom uh, with model tab being the default open tab and that's where you draw everything. All of the design elements should be drawn there no matter what. So lines and um, things that represent walls like that, the doors, all of those things that are physical objects in the design. Then the other layouts are your pages. So they're the things you're going to print. And if I click on those two, you can see layout one and layout two are just different setups for the views that I've already drawn or the plan that I've drawn. Oh, it's done automatically. So when you click on layout one and layout two, they'll be set up to be white by default. No, they're already there. So you always have layout one and layout two in a new file. Yep, that's right. So because in a program like this, you'll usually have several pages that you want permanently set up within your file ready to print. So you don't have to go and set up each time you're printing the different sheets. Two at least, and I'll maybe just show you very quickly one that I'm doing for one of the later year classes, where we have several pages set up already from the one drawing. And so they're laid out fairly roughly in this model tab where you draw everything and then you can clean it up and lay things out more neatly on those layouts. And so, so here, layout one is again where I'm starting and I'm going to right click on that and then choose rename. So, we know what it is, it's going to be a floor plan, and we know the scale. So I've typed what floor plan 1 to 50, and then enter, and notice it's not letting me enter that, because, yep, yeah, that's right, just by right clicking you can choose rename on the menu. But I can't finish that because I've put in a colon. And that's one of those characters that it doesn't like. 
It's a shame because that would be a very useful one to use. And so here we are. So I'm just going to change that to 1 50 instead. Now, later when we know the page size, we'll put that in as well. But I'm going to show you now how we can actually work out that page size now that we have the sheet. So we've got the page, we've got the new name. I'm going to right click on that new layout name and this time go to Page Setup Manager. So just when you right click on the Layout tab, then you'll see Page Setup Manager just above Plot. Now there you shouldn't need to choose anything except Modify. And you'll have then at the top a list of printers and often a good option there is to set this up for a virtual printer. So in other words a PDF converter so something you can print to, but it's going to create a PDF file that looks the way it would print instead of sending it to the physical printers. And that's a good way of checking things and then you can print that PDF if it's, if it's right. You can also email those to people and they should look exactly the same as it would if, if you printed it. So that's a standard way of setting things up, setting it up with a PDF converter and you have a few options. But if you scroll down the list, you'll see a really good one is DWG to PDF. Just DWG to PDF. And I'm choosing that because you'll always have that. The others are going to be dependent on the setup your computer has. So now, down below, we've got the paper size. And so the list of paper sizes is dependent on the printer you choose. And so here, again, because I've chosen this PDF option, I'll have a list of virtually all the paper sizes possible. And so I'm going to choose ISO A3, 420 by 297. So there's ISO A3. And then leaving the scale on one to one, that's really important that you realise it is one to one on a layout. And the only other option I'm going to choose is the plot style table. I'm going to set that to monochrome. Monochrome. So that's going to print black and white lines, or black lines and leave the background white, which is normally how you want these sorts of drawings to be. And so I'm going to click OK and then close and you'll see if you've done this that the page should be noticeably bigger. Right, so before that view would have taken up most of the page and now the page is bigger than before. So I'm going to select that viewport by selecting the border Then you can stretch using the grips on the corner, those blue handles. Click on one of those and you can stretch it in any direction to make it bigger. Doesn't need to take up the whole page, but you'll see in a minute. No, I just select it by clicking onto the edge. So I'll just press escape and do that again. So just selecting it by clicking on the edge, then you'll get the handles and you can click on those to change the size. So don't worry if you hide part of it. Here, if I bring the bottom up, it's going to hide part of the drawing. That's okay. Oh, that means you've got a metri an imperial template. That's okay. Just select the border and make the viewport bigger. Oh, click on um, 
just double click outside the, that viewport or press escape first and then, then just try that again just double click outside yeah. yep there we go and now try select, yep, select the border and make it bigger there we go so just stretch it right out now just check your page setup as well make sure it's uh, still on one to one And the same millimeters. Yeah. Yep, that's fine then. So yeah, so just make it bigger. Yeah. So if you zoom out, then you'll see the whole page. So now I want to change what I can see inside that viewport. And then you'll see at the bottom it's got a button that says paper. So if you click there, now you'll see that the viewport board is highlighted and that button now says model so that means we're in model space but we're not back on the model tab so I can pan and zoom and it's only going to do that inside the viewport so I'm going to set the scale there to, I'm sure you would have guessed 1 to 50 Yep. So notice you can pan, holding the wheel down is the best way. You can pan and that doesn't change the size of that drawing. So it won't affect the scale. But if you zoom, zooming is making things bigger and smaller and that will affect the scale. So you can't zoom after you've set the scale. You need to set the scale again if you do zoom without meaning to. Even if it's only a fraction, it will be off. So there, I'll go and choose 1 to 50 again. And I can still pan without changing the scale. So that's so that I can set annotation on the page as well as having the things showing there that I want. Yeah, that's right. That white border with the dashed... Uh, live there, which is the printable area. Your title block. Yeah. And so, so we've given you that. I'm going to just uh, click on the button that says model, which will take me back to paper. So I'm working on the page again. And now I'm going to insert the title block. Last week I showed you how you can draw a lot of those elements, but when you go to insert, so I'll do it on the, on the home tab. Now when I go to insert, it's giving me a list of the blocks that I've used previously. I don't want any, any of those, so I need to choose more options. And then browse. Go to the P drive. Tier design. CAD 1 week 8 folder and there's the title block file so I'm going to click open don't need any of these options on except for specify on screen for insertion point so the first tick box there on the left click OK and now you can see I can place that on the page it's a little bit outside the printable area but that's alright we'll worry about that later but it does fit you can see within an A3 page pretty well And so this has been set up for you. You can put your name and the other fields in just by typing in there. Oh, I should call them. Okay, so by putting in that information, when I click OK, I've got the um, text fields entered there already. Notice though the scale bar is a different colour, and that's because of my layer. So I just need to make a layer for 
the text. So if you look in the uh, list of standard layer names there, I wonder if they gave you annotation layers. They maybe didn't. No, okay. So, well, that's all right, let's make one. So I'm going to call it A Anno for annotation and title for title block. Make the color black. Black and white are the same color in AutoCAD. So here it doesn't have a black option. That's a really dark grey, but white there, you'll see, is the same as black. You can't print white, so black and white are the same. And then the line weight you can just leave on default, which is 0.25 anyway. And so if I select that title block anywhere, I can change the layer. So I just want to show you the scar because remember I showed you how to draw that last week and and you drew it if you did it then with the size that it tells you on the title block because we drew it in model space. So there, this is one metre from zero to one. In model space that would be the size. And maybe just to prove it to you I will open that file. So I do it like that deliberately just to again get you used to working with different scales. So there's the scale I did last week. Same thing as you have here. Oops, sorry, not that one. There. Basically the same. Okay, but this one, remember I drew in model space. So back to model, there it is, and I'm going to measure one metre. So I've just measured from the beginning to where it says one, and it's exactly a thousand. That's as it should be because that should be a measurement of a metre. So, but this one is on a page, and so this is the way it would be if you're drafting on a drawing board. So if I measure that, it's 10 mil. Now, the scale I think is actually wrong there. I think we need to check that. Uh, so <laughs> anyhow, the person who set this up, I think we've got to check that. It should be um, uh, 1,000 divided by uh, 50 which is not 10 mil, it's, uh, it's 20 mil. And so, uh, so that's going to be adjusted. I might, I'll fix that in a moment. And uh, well, I'll, I'll scale it right away so that you can insert this <coughs> and be sure it's the right size. <coughs> These things happen. So uh, I'll just leave it like that. It's a bit messy, I know, but it's better than having it the wrong size. And it's good then to see how to fix this. So, okay, so we know it's wrong. We know it's got to be fixed. So how do you do that? Delete it. And then insert again. Same way as before. More options. Browse. Find the file. Open. OK, and it will say the block definition has changed. Do you want to redefine it? Yes, I want to redefine. And now it's going to bring it in with the changes. So there, I can click on the corner, or I know with this one to type 0, 0. And again, I'm just going to put my details in again.
Okay, so second time lucky. Ah, oh, this one, so it's gone to the origin of the printable area. I forgot with PDFs, that's what it'll do. So I'll just move that across. And so now, let's measure that again. Second time lucky. There we are, 20 mil. Because that's the size it would be if it was printed. So when we print it out, it should be a 50th of, of the real size. So that's correct. And so annotation and anything that is, uh, contains uh, text or anything else that is scale dependent needs to work in the same way. So in the notes that you've been given, again I'll just uh, go to that folder. You've got this set up for DIM 50 dimension style. Now, all of those settings are, are going to be basically the same, no matter what, except for the fit tab. And this is really the most important thing and really what I'm trying to make clear to you. With that fit dimension tab, okay, so fit here is the tab that I'm on. Or I'm showing you, and there's really only one setting that matters, and that's the scale there. So this is for 1 to 50. You can set an overall scale there of 50, or you can use the option I'm going to show you, annotating. It's either or. So I'll show you both ways, but I'm going to end up by showing you the annotative option, which is it's actually easier, it just takes a bit more understanding to get it to work. So, remember to make your dimension style, you have the annotative or annotation panel there on your home tab. Click on that little menu and you've got firstly your text style, which I'll actually do afterwards. I'm going to make a dimension style first. So the buttons next to the list, the list there show you the styles you already have. So we've got a few dimension styles and a few text styles, but we're going to make our own. So clicking on dimension style there, next to the list. And, well, there actually are some already made by different people. But, like I said, we want to make our own. So it tells you here... how to change all of the settings. And, okay, so it doesn't matter which one you start with because you're going to put your own settings in. So I'll start with the default ISO 25 and I'm going to click new and put in my own name. So I'll start with scale 50 continue and I'll go through putting these styles in. Notice one little thing extend beyond ticks is grayed out at first because on the second tab, you'll see it's set to use an arrow. So that option only becomes available when you choose one of the tick options, either architectural tick or oblique. On that second tab, so you can see it's got ticks at the end there instead of arrows. And now when I come back to the lines tab, that settings become available there. So I'm going to type in Let's keep it to the same settings, so 3 and 2.5, that'll do. Two, yep, that's all that matters. So these settings basically affect the lines that you have coming out from the object and under the line, under the text there. So that long line and these short lines at the end. So if I was to make this line longer, you can see there now it sticks out more at the top there. I'll make it shorter. Obviously those lines become a bit shorter. And here it's sticking out at the end. We can make that, let's say, 1. So you can see it's noticeably shorter there. And again, make it long. And you can see it sticks right out. So if the changes aren't obvious, there's a problem with your scale. Uh, going through the rest, so symbols and arrows, I'm just going to leave the architectural ticks, I'm not going to change anything else there. Then text. Now here, 
you can probably just leave it on standard and set the text height, so here 2 mil. And then again, here's the important one, so with fit. So, so far everything has been in print sizes, in case you're wondering what these numbers mean. So 2 mil is the size it will print. And then on the fit tab, we can set an overall scale of 50. So that is going to work for 1 to 50 drawings. So scaling everything by 50, in other words. Uh, so I'm going to go to then primary units. Good option here is to set the precision to zero, so you don't have any decimal places. Set the decimal separator still to period. So in case you do get a decimal, you don't have a comma between that uh, between those numbers. And then you don't need to worry about alternate units or tolerances, leave those. So that's done. Okay. And then close. I may as well make a layer for my dimensions. A and O dim. And then I'm just drawing some of the main dimensions that you have here. Okay, so the dimensions they give you a pretty good indication, but uh, I want to show you the way that um, that it says the dimension in according to the Australian standard, which is to have external dimensions. So I'm going to click on the two corners. Also, oh, I've, I've clicked on the dimension linear button. Again, in the annotation panel, it's the button in the top right. I'm going to click two points and then place my dimension over to the left. and then do the same again but this time I'm going to go to the inside wall to do my wall thickness and then I'm going to go to the inside of the top left corner of that wall and so I'm thinking of so you stood mentioning with Revit, I'll do that again uh, on the annotate tab I'm going to use the dimension tools here just to make, uh, just to save a bit of time. So I'm going to draw in a linear dimension, place it to the left, and now I'm going to continue that. So you'll see there's an option there to continue, which will let you place a string of dimensions without having to go and choose linear dimension each time. Okay, so I've got those dimensions drawn. Just make it a bit tidier. But you can see it's not very neat because of the way it connects to the building or to the floor plan. So I'll adjust that in my uh, dimension style as well. So what I wanted to show you before I draw in any more dimensions is um, how to adjust that dimension style back to here. Same thing as before, dimension style. And Rather than change the one that I've got, I'm going to click on New and make a new one based on that previous style. So I'm going to call this one Anno for Annotative. So I didn't call it Annotative because I already have one called Annotative. So I'm going to hit Continue. And the only option I'm going to change at first, well, so there are two options, but the most important one is on the Fit tab. Instead of using an overall scale, I'm going to tick Annotative. So this is a newer way of doing dimensions than, um, well, the way it was done always in the past. So the way it was done in the past, you would create a dimension style for every different scale that you have in your drawing. So if you were to go and make a 1 to 100 drawing, you'd have to make a new dimension style and call it scale 100. 
If you're going to make a 1 to 20 drawing, you're going to have to make a new dimension style called scale 20. And then you'd have to set this value differently for each of those styles. With this new method, you don't have to do that. You just need the one dimension style for all scales. So it's much, much easier, much less work. And so that's it. Annotative. On the Fit tab, most important thing. While I'm at it, I'm also going to go to the Lines tab and turn on this option, Fix Length Extension Lines. And I'm going to set the length there to 7, I'll try. Well, maybe, no, so 5. It's pretty arbitrary, you'll see why in a minute. That is uh, going to be about 5, so that should be right. So we're going to click OK. So it's now the current style. I'm going to close this. And on the annotate tab, you'll find there's a button uh, that says update in the dimensions panel. So it should be the second button from the left in the last row there. That's update. I'm going to select it and then select all the dimensions I've drawn so far, press enter, and it's now updated them to the current style. Now, the text hasn't changed. The text is still the same size. But that fixed length extension line has changed the, the length of these lines. I can come back now and adjust those further, go to dimension styles, modify, and so 5 wasn't enough, let's try 10. OK, close, and now those lines are a bit longer. And notice they're all the same length, regardless of what they're measuring. So that, that's a good option. But again, the more important thing is the scale. And just to show you how it works, if I was to do a 1 to 100 plan, I could choose that from the list here, draw a dimension, and it's automatically the right size. Okay, so it's double the size, the text is double the size of the 1 to 50 text. Okay, so see, this is the sort of thing that will become clearer as you use the program more, and it's the same with all CAD programs. So, uh, so don't be worried if, if that doesn't make a whole lot of sense at first. You'll see, again, as you draw things that uh, more with CAD programs that it will become much clearer. So I'm going to put that back to 1 to 50 though and draw in my remaining uh, dimensions. So notice how I'm placing the overall dimension first and then the internal dimensions. And that's proper drawing practice that you should always follow. So do you know where to find the um, correct drawing conventions? For interior design and architecture? Which Australian standard to look for? AS 1100 anyway. So that's something that, you, if you want to get a copy in the Construction 2 folder, you'll see Australian standards. You can just go to the library and get it there. So, uh, okay, so going along to the um, dimensions at the bottom. I don't need to put the overall dimension because I've got that at the top, so I can just go along then to these internal measurements and then continue to place the others. Okay, so that's dimensions. And dimensions are things that often give people the most trouble when they're setting up AutoCAD initially. Now I can set up some text, and text is much easier. Next to text style, the list there, I can click on the text style button. And again, I'm going to click the new button. 
and we'll call it uh, something simple like notes and then again I'm going to tick annotative so do you remember the text heights that you used previously in the geometry exercise and um, and in the others as well so what sort of text types were you using exactly so yeah. yeah that well, that's what you want to print to heights like that but they're 350 that, that was the size you were typing in so you would have had heights like 250 350 and uh, other things like that in the geometry exercise and then in the ones after that too and you're using big big values like that because you've got to factor in the scale using that older method but if you remember to use annotative then you don't have to factor in the scale and you can just type the height that you want it to print so let's say we want it to print 5 mil I can just type in 5 set current that's fine, yes and then close so notes is my current style Arial is the font I can change that if I like but I'm happy with Arial and then again the most important thing the height 5 mil and this is what people often forget they'll go to draw text and forget to have made a text style and then the text height won't be clear at first and things are either way too big or way too small so we close this now so the other thing when you're drawing text it's always dependent on the scale so you can choose the scale here if you've got the 1 to 50 that should be fine and so we've got some notes here and I'll go and draw those now so 5 is big actually for this but that's ok I'm just going to go and draw with uh, either single line or multi line so I'll do single line click to make a start point make sure you read what it says on the command line it's asking for a rotation angle so 0 and then type in my text cloak covered enter twice and uh, you can see it's visible clearly legible but maybe that's you know a fair bit too large not a problem you can select it and then either double click or again select it and right click if you want to change the height go to properties and then you'll see the height that I gave before was 5 mil I want it to be about half that size so 2.5 oops just try that again 2.5 and there we are so notice I don't have to work out the scale to change my text height I just need to think about the size I want it to print because I've set the scale down here and the annotative option reads that scale basically so I could keep adding the rest of this text in the same way so if I wanted to automatically have it as um, 2.5 I can go back to the text style now and simply change it in there Okay, so single line text is good for single notes like this. Okay, so text and dimensions, as you use the program more, you'll get used to setting the scale or at least establishing the scale before you make those things but then the other, the other thing that's not um, clearly associated with the scale but it, it definitely is associated with scale is your line type so line type remember is dashed and dotted and other different line types so the best way to work with those I think is to use layers you can set them in properties just by choosing from the list here do you know what it means when it says by layer 
for any of those properties. It just means it's setting it with the layer. So notice how my red lines are red because they're on the wall layer. So it simply means that I'm using the layer to set the colour. If I change that wall layer to a different colour, those lines will all change. So that's what by layer means. It means you're setting the property by or with the layer. And that's normally the way to do it. So if I go and bring up layer properties, and I make a new layer, this won't be in your list. You'll need to use some judgement to know what to call this layer. So I'm going to call it A Fern Dash. Now just out of interest, looking at this drawing, are there any other layers that you maybe could use for the T area here other than the furniture layer? Yeah, okay, so what joinery exactly, that's right. So you'll see here it's got join and join above would be some layers you could use for joinery and built-in furniture really should be on joinery. But because it's not a very big plan, we can just for the time being use furniture, I think, for everything. But it's good to be thinking that way. And so I've got a fern dashed, as well as my furniture, a fern layer. Make the colour the same, so just magenta. But then I want the line type to be different. So where it's got continuous there, if I click there, none are loaded, but I can click load and get the full list. Now, yeah, yeah. So you get the load. Yeah, well, dashed is a big one. So I'm going to choose. Hidden two. Because dashed is too big. Hidden is just another kind of dashed line. So I've chosen it. I'm going to click OK. And then I've got to select it again in the list there. And then OK again. So now you can see it's set to my layer, hidden two. I'll close this after setting that current layer. Right, so the fridge there, it's under the counter, it's just uh, a bar fridge. So we could say it's about 700 wide, I'd say. So it's going to offset 700 from the wall edge. Actually, probably it's wider than that, maybe 800. And change that layer to the dash furniture layer. Trim it back. Draw your line in. And we're done with the fridge. Yeah, years of practice. But, uh, I mean, look, after using AutoCAD for maybe a year and a half, I was about that fast. Uh, but I was using it, you know, 40 hours, 40 to 60 hours a week, um, which is, you know, the amount of class time you have in a semester. So, so that's why I keep saying, if you're using it outside of class, you'll get much better, much faster, and it's a uh, fewer benefit because uh, you use the program constantly for all your other projects and your other subjects, and it will just make your life easier if you, you you're going to put the time in at some point. So you may as well do it sooner rather than later. So, uh, going to the, um, the notes here, you can see it tells you to draw the conference table with 1200 by 600 rectangles. So that's a fairly simple thing to do. So drawing a rectangle, 1200 across by 600. You can uh, move them to be centred using lots of different methods, but I'm going to use one here that I like, which is to uh, use object tracking. So that's 
got, probably got to come down a bit further, but it's centred at least, and I'll, I'll move it down further afterwards. So now, yeah, we need, uh, is it five of those? So I'm going to copy that. So we've got five of them. And now we want an arc on each end. So, again, looking through the options you have for arcs, there are lots of different options there. Maybe start end angle or start end direction or start end radius, any of those would be good because we know the start and the end point. So the start point and then the end point and then you can come... Sorry, uh, not, did I choose start end angle? I meant to choose start end direction. So choosing those two points and now you can bring it up to set the direction. So you could just do this visually, you don't need to do this uh, very accurately. So as long as it looks like that drawing. So I'm going to mirror that arc just by selecting it and click mirror. Snap to the midpoint of the middle table. Clip it to the bottom. And then I'm going to explode the top and the bottom rectangle so I can delete those extra lines. So that's the conference table done. And then the chairs, if you remember in the um, geometry exercise, you did a very similar chair. So it doesn't need to be exactly like those, but I'm going to give you a basic method you could use to draw essentially very su something very similar to these. So just by drawing circles the way you would have in that geometry exercise, So, I think they're a bit smaller than a normal chair, so I think they're about 300. Or, sorry, what am I saying? Or, yeah, so we want the diameter of those to be about uh, 400. I don't think they give you a size. Has anyone noticed the size for the chairs in the notes there? Yeah. Two sixty. Okay. So, all right. So, okay. So the inner radius. Okay. So we'll just make that two sixty. So this is you could use fillet. Fillet's a bit fiddly though with rectangles. I find so. I tend to just do, do things like this with uh, circles. And then what about the, uh, the thickness? Oh yeah, okay, and then, yep, yeah, okay. Yeah, that should be about right. And then that should be, 640, so there's something that could be out there. Ah, oh, so there must be straight lines at the back there. Well, yeah, I suppose you could do it like that. And uh, so, not a problem if you need to change the size of uh, any of those. Okay, maybe I'll show you the way they said do in the notes. Um, the way in the geometry exercise you did it was with a circle, obviously, but here, because it's got a straight section at the back, Come out minus 600 and then offset uh, 60. So then if you fill up that, so the inner rectangle 480, so yeah, so the outer one will be definitely, uh, or could be 260, so radius 260 and then just choose these lines and then so the inner radius needs to be 60 less than that so when you fill it 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 would be 200 so that it's going to give you a parallel curve So 
So 60 less than the outer radius because that's the offset distance. And then you have some arcs on the corner and well we could just do 60 for that radius as well I think would work since that's the offset amount that would make sense and then from there it probably makes sense to explode the inner line stretch those lines across and then fill up those but if you try and fill it with a 60 radius it will uh, probably give you some errors so I'm going to fill it with a 50 mil radius and then you could use mirror with ortho on and I'll do the same to get the line Okay, so that's going to give you the chairs. Exactly. And I don't know if it mentions using a block for those. Yeah, it does. So here it says you can block the chairs so they become grouped, essentially. And that's easier than you might think. You just need to select them. In the block panel, you'll see the create button. Give it a name. Click a base point. So I'm going to click onto the front of the chair click OK and now that's all one thing it is, yeah, very similar, yeah, exactly yeah. so I'm going to then use copy or let's say you could use array oh no, so they're using the um, light and divide, exactly Yeah, it will, yeah. So, uh, I'll show you how to use Array for something different. So, on the uh, Modify tab, you can see the Array button, Rectangular Array. Since you've used it before, uh, you can then just play with these values. So, here you can see it's got four columns. That's right, we just need, we don't need any, uh, so we need, uh, so we do need four. We don't need any rows. Or so, which way are we going? No, so we don't need any columns. So one column, and then we want three. We want four rows. You can also click on the arrows to adjust the values. So that arrow at the end there sets the number in either direction, and then the arrow that's close to the base point sets the distance, so I can use that to change the spacing. So that's, I think, an easier way of doing the spacing if you want to try using Array. And notice how when you do an Array, it will group all of those objects together. And then you can use Mirror to flip those to the other side. And you're done. So now I can move the whole thing down get it centered more within the room and that's good enough so then lastly I have the overhead projector screen which will be on the um, oh, in the cupboard so that on the, the same layer I used for the fridge I've got that dashed layer I'll just use that and so again I'm just going to draw a rectangle very roughly I know you probably give it a size for this but something like a projector screen it only needs to be drawn fairly graphically anyway. So that's good enough. And then the uh, coat hanger, or the coat rack, again, would just be a dashed line. And just use the furniture layer for the uh, for the clothes 
and with the ellipse tool you can just draw one again just by eye it's good enough and once you're happy with it copy and rotate so I've got a couple there which probably would be rotated slightly so I've selected it and I'm going to go to rotate turn ortho off and then just by eye get that to the angle I want copy it again with ortho on and then one last time and now I'll rotate again with also off to get a different angle and that's it I think that's everything in the drawing except a couple of notes which I'm sure you can work out so now back to my layout tab you can see that's all ready to go except that the border I'm going to move to this layer def points which you'll see is in the list of standard layers and it's a non-printing layer so then I'll show you if I go to well firstly save and then I'll go to print preview and that's how it'll print out that's good to zoom in see the line weights and just check generally whether things fit on the page so you can see here this is being chopped off a little bit and so I could always try moving that slightly back to print preview and there we go it's still missing a little bit so again just need to move that up slightly it's got that printable area there as a guide And there we are. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, once you've done that exercise, maybe next week. I'll show you how you can create a template from that because that does have most of the setup in it that you'll need for the later exercises so you don't have to keep doing it over and over again but it is good just for practice to do it a few times to get used to it before saving all those settings